Okay, well let's start with the thing that you came up with. Um, I heard some of you talking about the uh, resurrection accounts or Easter accounts, which we'll actually dedicate uh, some time to next time. So let's have some examples, if we can, from accounts related to you know, either the lead up to the crucifixion or the crucifixion. Um, what are some of the differences that you saw? You notice in Luke, instead of um, Jesus taking the bread and then the wine, the wine first. Is that just a random detail? Is there anything that that might actually be able to clue us into? Did you find any significance in it? Um, or not really? No, I just so. yeah. There's some interesting things to note about that. One of them is that you know, there seems to be in Luke's Gospel, at least in some manuscripts of Luke's Gospel, multiple cups of wine. And that fits what we know of the Passover practice right, in later times. And so one reason why that might be significant, if we were to look into it and investigate more detail, is that Luke might be saying quite clearly that uh, the account that he's giving of what we know as the Last Supper, right, that final meal Jesus and his disciples before the crucifixion, was a Passover meal. Right? If we look at the Gospel of John, right, we have this account that has the Jewish leaders depicted as not entering Pilate's headquarters, John 19.28, so to avoid ritual defilement and be able to eat the Passover. Right? And so, in spite of the fact that there have been attempts to get the two to match up, the chronology of these um, accounts, uh, the Synoptic Gospel on the one hand, the Gospel of John on the other, seem not to fit together. Right? And so, one of the things that this might help us to realize from the outset is that while many approach these accounts and just blend all the details together and assume that you know, if you just combine all the details, what you end up with is a historical account of what really happened. In some cases, right, a concern with symbolism, with theology, might take precedence over history. Right? Um, for an author to be more concerned to connect Jesus' death with the Passover than to give a chronology that matches up with other accounts suggests that the author's priorities might be different than those of some modern readers. Right? At the very least, we might start asking those questions. Who knew that a cup of wine could have such an effect? Mm -hmm. yeah. so, actually, a really good example of the difference. Uh, the question of how the various accounts of the Last Supper relate to one another is also interesting because whereas a lot of the details that are found in the Gospels we don't find in our earliest New Testament sources, which are the letters of Paul. In the case of the account of the Last Supper, we have a close connection with something that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians and connects with the Christian practice of the Lord's Supper. Right? And so there, too, we have, um, we have connections that we can make. And Paul and Luke are closer to one another than either of them is to Matthew and Mark. And in John, of course, you don't have a, a Last Supper, per se. There is a get-together meal, but there's no symbolic words over the bread and the wine. Some of these differences are important. They'll clue us into what's important to these various authors, what they're trying to say about Jesus. Right? And for today, we're going to ask some historical questions, but we're also going to ask some questions about what each author is trying to say about Jesus. Through the what other differences did you note? Any others? Let's talk about them. Um, in Mark, when he was asked if he was the Messiah, he said, I am. But in Matthew and Luke, he said, you say, you say so. So that's a, that's a difference between the two. Yeah, any thoughts on the significance of that? You or anyone? Uh, I am is fairly clear. You say, that's what you say. That's a little different, right? It's not necessarily a denial, but it's also not as big <coughs> an affirmation as we get in Mark. Why might that be the case? Well, we're going to actually talk about the way certain titles or designations for Jesus are used in um, the Gospels. In particular, Mark's Gospel, because uh, most scholars think that's the earliest of the Gospels in the New Testament. And so, terms like Christ or Messiah. They're in fact central to the question of why the crucifixion of Jesus is so important and takes the role that it does and is interpreted in the way that it is in the New Testament. 
Any other examples? Mark and Matthew say that it was two days before Passover, but Luke isn't as precise and says that Passover was near. Yeah, and one interesting question is um, how the various Gospels relate to one another. There's a large amount of agreement that Mark was written first, right, because when we see the relationship between the Gospels and the New Testament, it seems like those who come later are more likely to be using Mark and adapting Mark than the other way around. When Luke's Gospel was written, and whether the author of Luke's Gospel might have known John's Gospel, right, which is the latest of the New Testament Gospels, is something of an open question. Could Luke have been aware that there were different viewpoints on how these, you know, how the final meal of Jesus related to the Passover that year and things of that sort? Was Luke trying to leave an opening for more than one viewpoint on that? Interesting observation. Got one more before we move on? Anyone? Okay. Well, well, we'll be looking at some more of them. Uh, let's start with the theme that's tying together um, the, the several classes, these several classes, which is the theme of holidays. And the holiday connected with the passion of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, is known in the English-speaking world as Good Friday. And so, one obvious question is, why call it that? What's good about Good Friday? Uh, how does an event that celebrates somebody's execution <coughs> become known as Good Friday? Um, it's not something that's universal in terms of you know, other languages, right? Call it all kinds of things from Great Friday to Black Friday um, to a number of other things. And so we won't get into that since it's not something that's universal or necessarily particularly ancient. But the goodness that's inherent in that name does highlight that early Christians gave a positive interpretation to the crucifixion. And one obvious question I ask is why it does the crucifixion become so central to the early Christians? From the perspective of Christian theology, of course, the short answer is, well, because it was a salvific event, Jesus was dying for the sin of the world, things of that sort. But if we're asking as a historical question, how does the crucifixion take the central role in Christian theology? Well, notice that in the Gospels themselves, and this is something that suggests that you know, they are not simply written to depict Christian theological concern, but actually contain historical information. If we look at, let's say, the Gospel of Mark, since it's the earliest, we'll find that although the drama and the logic of the account is moving quickly towards the crucifixion, there isn't a lot of interpretation offered by Jesus of the crucifixion. There's not a lot of focus on these events. There's not a lot of sense that people had a, an understanding of what was going to happen or their significance prior to that. And so it's clear that it's with hindsight, from the perspective of hindsight, uh, from a, what sometimes from a post-Easter perspective, right? Once Christians become persuaded that Jesus had been raised from the dead, had been vindicated by God, the question then becomes, okay, so why the crucifixion? What's puzzling about the idea of a crucified Messiah? What is it that makes the idea of a crucified and particularly a crucified Davidic Messiah. A puzzling concept. Right? Paul mentions in his letters that this was foolishness to Greeks, a stumbling block to Jews, and yet it's central to his message. What makes it puzzling or troubling? What do you remember about the concept of a, a Messiah descended from David? What was, that, what was the expectation regarding that figure? And so you've been researching this topic a little bit. Um, well, the who is David? The king of David. Okay. King David. And so there was no longer a descendant of David on the throne. And the expectation of an anointed one, right? The anointing was the practice of the king as well as high priests. So an anointed one of David's line expects the restoration of what? The kingship, right? To a descendant of David, to the dynasty of David. 
What do you think Jews in this period expected a figure of that sort to do? I mean, what do you expect a king who comes from the line of ancestral kings that's supposed to be there, what might you expect such a figure to do if he appeared? Yeah. They wanted like a strong leader that was going to basically kind of maybe not necessarily avenge the wrongs of the other people, but to raise up the nation of Israel. And instead, um, Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead. So that's not necessarily their expectations. There's nothing that w is more likely to ca be considered an automatic disqualification for somebody, you know, in terms of being considered possibly being the anointed one descended from David, the Messiah, than being executed by the foreign rulers over the Jewish people. And so the notion of a crucified Davidic Messiah seems like an oxymoron, seems like a, a contradiction in terms. And it's for that very reason that the early Christians spend so much time asking why the crucifixion? Why should the Messiah have had to undergo that? Right? The best way to explain this, and this is also important for a historical question, right? if you search online, you'll find that there are, on certain corners of the internet, views that are not reflected in you know, not mainstream historical scholarship, uh, people who suggest that you know, maybe Jesus was not uh, a real historical figure, uh, maybe somebody just came up with a good story and started proclaiming it. If you proclaim a crucified Messiah in a Jewish context, a crucified Davidic Messiah, you're basically shooting yourself in the foot from the very beginning. Right? You're making this <coughs> as hard to accept as possible. Right? And while people do come up with all kinds of weird beliefs, right? um, I'm sure we could think of examples, but we won't go there unless we get distracted, um, is it more likely that the early Christians said, let's come up with something really, really hard to persuade people and then go out and proclaim it. Or that they believed that this figure of Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. He was crucified. They might have lost their faith as a result if it weren't for certain experiences that they had that persuaded him that, no, no, he's, he actually was the Messiah. They're still persuaded. They're persuaded that God to vindicate him beyond death. And so they retain their faith that he's the Messiah, their hope that he's the Messiah. Uh, perhaps become more convinced as a result of <coughs> whatever kinds of experiences they had. And then have to find a way of explaining, okay, so then why would God in his infinite wisdom ordain for the Messiah to undergo a painful and shameful death? The latter seems like a more plausible explanation of what is likely to have happened from the perspective of historians. And so Within Judaism, there was a tradition, right, and we get this expressed both in some earlier works and even more so in uh, works like fourth, the Fourth Book of Maccabees, which uh, probably is around the same time as or slightly later than Paul's letters, of the possibility of somebody suffering on behalf of others. And so the early Christians drew on traditions such as the story of Abraham nearly sacrificing his son and use that language and echo that language, right? God did not spare his only son. Right? Language taken straight out of Genesis. They drew on language of sacrifice to make sense of this. And so the reason why the crucifixion becomes the central focus of early Christian proclamation is probably because it was the most puzzling thing. And so both for the sake of their own worldview and making sense of their beliefs, and the proclamation of those beliefs to others, Christians had to focus on this and make sense of it and offer an explanation of why things should have happened or should have transpired in this way. And it's as a result of that explanation that's given that it comes to be known as Good Friday in the English-speaking world, right? because this event is viewed as salvific in Christian theology. Any questions, comments, or observations? Okay, well then let's move on and take a look at our earliest actual account of Jesus' crucifixion. So, among the references in Paul's letters, we probably could piece together some key details which would match up with the later narrative accounts, right? Reference to, um, references to suffering, references to humility, references to crucifixion, and everything. 
But in Paul's letters, we don't have a narrative, and that's understandable. Right? Um, again, the so-called Jesus mythicists who suggest that there wasn't such a figure will often point to the fact that Paul doesn't say a lot of things that they expect that he might have. But Paul's writing to Christians. Right? And so it's ridiculous to imagine that Paul would have written to Christians and felt the need to spell out to them things that the first time you mention Jesus to people, you have to begin to explain if you're you know, trying to persuade them to believe that he is who Christians believe that he was. And so in Paul's letters, we don't get a narrative um, version of this. But in the Gospel of Mark and in other Gospels, we actually do. And Mark's Gospel has been described once by a scholar as a passion narrative with an extended introduction. Because in terms of the amount of space given to it, right, several chapters are devoted to the crucifixion. And from a key turning point in the story, that's where it's headed. Beginnings are important in understanding books. And one of the things that I want to make sure we do, even though it's likely that the Gospels were composed in such a way that Christians could read parts of them probably you know, when they gathered for worship on Sunday morning or um, on the road. Nevertheless, right, these Gospel authors wrote books. And very often, forgetting that, forgetting to ask, how does the author clue us into what they're trying to say and these kinds of things? Oftentimes, important things get missed. Right? And beginnings and endings are important. So we're going to focus particular attention on the beginning of Mark and the ending, which is, of course, kind of the crucifixion and then a hint of the resurrection. We'll talk more about that. The Gospel of Mark starts with the beginning of the good news, or Gospel, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And already we've got footnotes there. Um, I don't know how many of you read footnotes normally um, in any books you read. Um, even if you look at photos in scholarly books that you read for <coughs> academic purposes, you may well be among those who don't read footnotes in the Bible. But they're actually important. Um, and sometimes more important than others. In this case, you look at the footnote, and it says, other ancient authorities lack the Son of God. Uh, what does that mean? Um, there were some ancient people who didn't believe Jesus was the Son of God. What it means is, other ancient authorities, other ancient manuscripts, Right. Some ancient manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark don't have the words the Son of God there. There are two possible ways of explaining that. This is one of those instances where looking at which are our earliest manuscripts, you know, which are likely to be most reliable, doesn't settle the matter. Right? It's, it's not a clear-cut case. If it was not part of the Gospel originally, then presumably it was added by somebody who picked up on a major theme in this Gospel, because this way of referring to Jesus as the Son of God is going to be important. If it was originally part of the Gospel and was left out, it's probably because we have a series of words which are all in what's in Greek referred to as the, uh, called the genitive case, right? Of, of, of. And we have this long series of words all with that same ending. Right? And if you've ever copied a series of words all, that all end the same way, you'll know that it's easy to have your eye jump and miss something. Right? So having it added because it actually does pick up on and help the reader understand the major theme of this gospel is plausible. It's also possible that it was left out. Before we go any further, let's ask the question, what does Son of God mean? And there's a lot of possible meanings that this could have. And what we want to ask is, which of those, if any, might have been in view in the mind of this author? What are the, some of the possible things that Son of God could be? Well, since Mary was a virgin, there was no technical, like, biological father, I guess. So, since God, like, overshadowed her, Son of God, that conclusion. So, could be a reference to you know something like virginal conception, and of course, in the wider world of this time, right? Certainly the Greek and Roman context, gods could have children right, with human beings. Uh, in fact, there are lots and lots of stories of this. Uh, within a Jewish context, though, such stories were not particularly appreciated, right? Mm -hmm. And so, one question we have to ask is, you know. Is that what 
some people at that time might have understood by the phrase in general, sure. Is it likely to be what early Jewish Christians meant by the term? Probably not. And even if we ask virginal conception, well, Mark doesn't mention that. Right? And so, is this, a, is this a concept that he already has and he just doesn't mention it? Or do those stories come about later? Right? So it's certainly one of the possibilities. What are some of the others? What else might Son of God mean in this context? Yeah. Uh, could it just be somebody who follows God's rules that he set out? So just out of respect that you're considered like a sign? Yeah, so somebody who relates to God with the sort of respect and obedience that one gives to a father. Um, so somebody who's righteous, you might say. And in fact, in a passage that we looked at um, very briefly, or I mentioned in class very briefly, from a work that's in the Apocrypha known as The Wisdom of Solomon, uh, there's this account of the righteous person, right, which Matthew's Gospel in the Passion Narrative uh, seems to echo, right, talking about the, uh, the wicked plotting against the righteous, planning on putting him to death, and saying, if he's, you know, he, he thinks of himself as God's son, and so let's see if God rescues him. Right? And there are echoes of that in Matthew's Passion Narrative. And so, within a Jewish context, one of the main ways that this phrase was used is for a righteous individual. We, we need at least one more on this list. Um, well, this might be completely different, but I was thinking that the Jews are the children of God, and he's like restoring the line because he's going to be restoring the line of David, so maybe that's kind of... Okay, yeah, and one of the things you might remember, again, another passage that comes up in the New Testament, but from um, earlier works, Hosea, right, chapter 11, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son, right? So, um, as a way of designating the people of Israel collectively, and sometimes right, the Is Israelites as you know, children of God. And there's one more. Right? We sometimes get a reference to angels. Right? There's that story in the book of Genesis about the sons of God and the daughters of men. And it sounds like it's got, uh, it has something to do with human angelic hanky-panky or something like that. Uh, we don't want to get sidetracked into that, but all of these are ways that the phrase could be used in this time period. Right? And so, when the Gospel of Mark uses this phrase, the question we need to ask is, which of any of these did the author have in mind? And really the only way to answer that is to read through the Gospel as a whole, and we're not going to read through the entire Gospel. No? But one of the interesting ways of trying to get at the author's answer to this question, and perhaps I should mention, this is um, a question that's relevant not just to you know, sort of biblical interpretation, but also to modern day interreligious dialogue, because um, <coughs> within the Islamic tradition, for instance, there's a, a strong revulsion, I think it would be safe to say, about such language. Um, and certainly, given you know, Islam's monotheistic concern, um, reacting against the worship of you know, gods who are thought of as you know, very large extended families with you know, father god and mother god and uh, baby gods, doesn't sound quite right, but you know what I mean, right? Um, the language that Christians used of God having a son, especially when it sounds like you know, God's having a son with Mary and you know, stuff like that, causes a lot of um, offense and concern and things like that. Is that, in fact, what early Christian authors like <coughs> the author Mark meant? It might be relevant to those modern interactions as well. So, right? What does the author mean? Well, one way to get at this is to ask, who in the Gospel of Mark understands that Jesus is the Son of God? Who refers to him in that way? And, in fact, we have two heavenly voices which refer to Jesus as... God's son, right? At in the kind of uh, the baptism, you have this description of the Holy Spirit coming, descending on him like a dove, and a voice comes from heaven. You are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And also in the account of the transfiguration later on, there's a heavenly voice which says, "This is my son, my love. Listen to him." And so, the Gospel of Mark attributes the view that Jesus is the Son of God to God twice. And so presumably, even without 
you know, the question of the first verse being answered, right? Was it there, highlighted in the very first line of the work? The author says, this is God's perspective on Jesus. And so presumably, it's also the perspective that the author has and that the author wants readers to adopt. If we ask who among human beings in the story recognizes Jesus as Son of God, well, we have that view attributed to people who are demon-possessed and so presumably have supernatural knowledge. But who's the first ordinary, non-demon-possessed human being in the Gospel of Mark to identify Jesus as the Son of God? Does anybody know? Does anybody want to venture a guess? You won't lose anything by taking a stab at it. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. I can't finish all my Well, before that. Um, or, well, it's not, it's not him, but. Uh, it's not just before that. There's a famous moment when you might have expected that it might have caught. Like, there's a story about Jesus asking his disciples, Who do people say that I am? Right? And they come up with these various answers. Some say, you know, uh, this chapter 8, right, starting with verse 7. Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say the prophet. He asked him, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Messiah, or Christ. And if you only know Matthew's version of this, you might find Mark's, surprising, uh, might Mark's version surprising. Because in Matthew's version, there's, you know, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Like, in other words, a big thumbs up. Right? Um, this is divinely revealed to you, stuff like that. And in Mark's version, Peter says, you're the Messiah, and Jesus basically says, shh. <laughs> and he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. And then he begins to tell them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, be rejected, be killed. And then Peter starts rebuking Jesus. Jesus calls Peter Satan. It's not a good day for Peter. And it's really, <laughs> it's one of these. It's but the phrase Son of God is abused there. And if we ask, when does a human being identify Jesus as the Son of God in this Gospel, it's actually like the first person is the centurion at the cross who sees Jesus die, and sees how he died. Right? Uh, chapter 15 of Mark's Gospel, verse 39. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was God's son. And so, if we ask, what does this mean? Right? What is the author trying to say by having the first person who gets the divine perspective on Jesus be the witness of the crucifixion? Maybe that'll take us in the direction of you know, answering that question. Adam. Uh, did the centurion identify it by the after effects of his death when he breathed his last? Because wasn't there like an earthquake and... Um, like rocks were split and the temple like well there and you may be you may be thinking of some uh, events that are only mentioned in Matthew's gospel right which even has some you know saints apparently rising from graves and things like that what we get here is that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom but it's not likely that the centurion could see that from this location right and so while that statement is highlighting that this is a significant event and you know, their importance and things like that. It's not clear that the centurion had the benefit of those, in Mark's Gospel at least. And so, if one is reading Mark's Gospel and doesn't have other outside information, you probably understand that it's on the basis of how Jesus dies, and that alone, that the centurion responds in this way. And so, presumably, the message is that in order to understand who Jesus is, and even to understand his role as Messiah or anointed one of Christ, you have to understand him as son of God, and that involves understanding the crucifixion. Right? And the focus in the Gospel of Mark really is on the disciples failing to understand what Jesus is calling them to do, particularly when he talks about following on the way that leads to the cross. Right? And so 
the emphasis seems to be, right, not on virginal conception, not on angelic status, not any of that, but on Jesus is the one who is obedient to God, even following all the way to death and calling others to follow in that way. There's a little anecdote I heard. I'm not sure if it's a true story, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway because it's a cute story. I love cute stories. But I also think it might just help fix the importance of this event in Mark's Gospel in your minds. Um, how many of you have seen a movie about the life of Jesus? Some of you? And of course, one of the interesting things about the Passion of the Christ as a movie is that you know, just suddenly, you know, suddenly, you're in a story about somebody who's going to be killed, right? And without any introduction, of course, the filmmaker is assuming that people know the story, but without any introduction, right, it can be puzzling, right? Uh, Mark's Gospel at least has some details about Jesus' life that, you know, on a historical level, how the story gets there. One of the classic movies about the life of Jesus, um, and usually they're longer, and of course, you know, since the Passion of the Christ is so long, you can imagine, you know, one reason probably has to do with the fact that traditionally, you know, you make a mini-series about the life of Jesus, or you make a very, very long movie that modern moviegoers are unlikely to watch. But one of the classic movies about the life of Jesus featured John Wayne in a cameo role as the centurion at the foot of the cross. I can't remember which, which of the movies it was. Any of you seen that one? Does that ring any bells? Any of you? Yeah. I heard the story that when they were filming, right, that particular scene, right, towards the, the end of the process, the director says, action! And John Wayne delivers his line, which I will not do justice to his style, but he says something like, surely this man was the son of God. <laughs> <laughs> and the director says, cut! Humbly, because he's dealing with a big Could you try it with more awe? Yes. And so they shout action again, and the story as I heard it was that John Wayne then said, Ah, oh, surely this man is the <laughs> son of God. Um, now, I don't know if that's a true story or not, but chances are that, um, like all things that you learn in all classes, some of the stuff that you remember will be the little stories. Right? And so hopefully, if you remember that story, it will remind you, because it will be connected in your mind to our discussion today, that that moment in Mark's story of the crucifixion is a decisive one. It's the first time that somebody gets that perspective that the author of the Gospel Mark depicts as a divine perspective on Jesus. And so it's suggesting that it's only in light of the crucifixion that Jesus' identity would be understood correctly. But we're going to talk more about the life of Jesus and the rise of early Christian beliefs about Jesus next time. And so uh, for today, we'll end it there. If there are any questions, we can come back to the next time.